balancing the budget, and reforming government. Good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about how to solve the problems that we defined that face our country. I think we can come to the conclusion immediately with this quote. History repeats itself. The budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced. The arrogance of public officials should be controlled. These are not new words. Cicero said these words over 2,000 years ago, but certainly they apply to our country today. Anytime we do anything, we try to learn from experience. We learned a lot from the first program from your comments. First, you wanted better charts that you could see the fine print on, and you'll have those tonight. Secondly, we had one news announcer criticize the pointer that I used before. So, since we're dealing with voodoo economics, a great young lady from Louisiana sent me this voodoo stick, and I will use it as my pointer tonight. And certainly it's appropriate because, as you and I know, we are in deep voodoo. Well, let's get right to work. Let's sort of do a quick summary of what we discussed before in terms of where we are, then we'll go to the solution. We're $4.1 trillion in debt. That's a staggering burden to pass to our children. It's unconscionable. Just this year, we ran up $341 billion in new debt. And as we discussed the other night, that's our legislators and our president trying to buy our vote this year with what used to be our money. We're not that dumb. Now, where does the money come from? It comes from all these places, and we get $1.1 trillion coming in the door. The two major sources are individual income tax and Social Security and Medicare. Corporate income tax is the third. The others are fairly small. How much money do we spend? We got a trillion one coming in, but we're spending a trillion five. Most of that goes to Social Security, Medicare, and other entitlements. Next to that is national defense, a little over $300 billion. Next to that is interest on the debt. That's unusually low this year because the interest rates are so low, but don't count on that continuing. Every time the interest rates go up 1%, the 70% of the national debt that's five years or less goes up $28 billion. That's the impact. What is the net effect of the way our country's been run? What used to be a dollar in 1950 is now 18 cents. No wonder both parents are working, some of them two jobs, just to make ends meet. Running the value of the dollar down is really hurting the people in our country. Now let's look at the net effect on all of us. From 77 to 92, the poorest got poorer, the second poorest fifth, this is 20% of the population, still lost money, the middle fifth, the three-fifths up, still lost money. When you get to the four-fifths, it's break-even. The richest fifth is the only place it went up. Now go to the top 5% and the top 1%. Top 5% improved their incomes by 60%. The top 1% by 138%. Trickle-down economics didn't trickle, and this isn't fair. All right, what about our average hourly wage at a time when we need to have everybody at work and making more money so that we can pay our bills? Just follow it here. It's 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it's dropping. Shouldn't surprise you, supply and demand, we've got people out of work. Well, just to show you how fouled up the system is, in the middle of all this, what's happening to our corporate executive salaries compared to those of our industrial competitors who are beating us in head-to-head -head competition? Here's the ratio between worker compensation and executive compensation in Japan. Here's the ratio in Europe, and here is the ratio in the United States. Trickle-down economics didn't trickle at all, folks. It all stopped right here. That's not good for the companies. That's not good for the stockholders. That's not good for the country. And that leaves us vulnerable. The, excuse me. These guys want to make this kind of money. They ought to be TV anchormen, basketball players, uh, or rock stars. But running a company, look, these fellows have their heads straight here. They're getting appropriate income but not rock star income. Let's look at our international competitors. Now, you don't have to like the fact that we live in a tiny world, but I'm telling you, we're stuck with it. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Here we are. Look at how they are growing. Here's our growth. Here's Japan's growth. Here are the newly industrialized Asian countries that at one time you and I thought just raised rice. They're not raising rice anymore, folks. They've got what used to be the high-paying jobs here over there. 
This chart makes it as clear as I can to you in terms of who is going to own tomorrow. Think of Taiwan, tiny little island. There it is, just in a little piece of Texas. They're going to spend $600 billion on public investment programs. Our great country is going to spend $150 billion, one-fourth that much. We have a population of 248 million. Taiwan has 20 million. In fact, we're over to about 12 times their population, and we're spending a fourth as much preparing for the future. All right, let's go from there to Japan. Here is Japan. Japan is about the size of Montana, if you pack it all together. It's much smaller than it appears on the map. Has a population half our size, but Japan is spending $80 billion right now on building for the future, short term. Now let's go to Germany. Keep your eye on Germany. I told you that you know, they're paying a, paying a good price for money. Germany is right here in purple. Germany has 78 million people, but Germany will spend $1 trillion over the next 10 years rebuilding East Germany. We'd better get busy and start rebuilding our great country and not just wandering around saying, well, everything will work out if we don't do anything. Does that ever happen in your life? Say, maybe the problem will go away in my life. If I ever take that attitude, the problem just grows and grows and grows. If you want to have it go away, you make it go away. Okay, here's the end result of letting our country decay like this. The 18 to 24-year-old men in this country back in 1980, 18% of them made less than 12,000 a year. In 1990, it's up to 40%. With the women, in 1980, 29% made less than 12,000 a year. Today, 48% make less than 12,000 a year. And it is voodoo economics. And maybe now's the time for me to wave the voodoo stick and get rid of the hex. But it'll take a lot more than that. It'll take millions of you showing up on November the 3rd to get rid of this hex. Keep in mind, the value of the dollar is going down. The number of people making less than $12,000 is going up. I don't want to bore you with this statement, but trickle down didn't trickle. It just didn't work. We have 19th century capitalism in this country. Our successful international competitors are practicing modern-day capitalism. We need to practice 21st century capitalism. We need an intelligent, supportive relationship between government and business. We need long-term thinking. We need to target the industries of the future and make sure they are here and the words made in the USA are written across them. We need to have the most rapidly growing small business society in the world because we can create more jobs more quickly there. All of this can be done. But just look at that, and I think you'll conclude the way we're going is the wrong way. Here are the solutions. We're going to start with balancing the budget. We've got to cut general spending by $315 billion, business tax increases of $49 billion, other tax increases of $293 billion, entitlement reform will bring us $268 billion, spending increases to help build our country an additional $109 billion, tax decreases $62 billion, it nets out savings of $754 billion. We gotta balance the budget just like you have to balance your budget. Congressional Budget Office projection out through 98 is here. Our plan takes us down to here. That's a $754 billion deficit reduction. Do we have to do it? Of course we do. We're gonna have a 10% cut in discretionary programs. We'll have a 5% cut in specific programs. These discretionary programs include such things as science grants, farm supports, government operations, et cetera, et cetera. Down here, we'll have a $22 billion cut in business subsidies, and we will have, over this period of time, $145 billion in interest savings just because we stopped spending so much extra money. Tax decreases, it's not all bad news. We will have a $27 billion decrease in taxes to get an investment tax credit, and that money will be spent to build new factories, buy plant and equipment, and create jobs. That money's spent right on the bullseye. Doesn't go in somebody's pocket to buy a yacht. Right over here, we're going to have a decrease here, and it's a tax credit to stimulate research and development. We call it now research and experimentation. You and I used to call it R&D. 
But this is to target the industries of the future and make sure that we lead and dominate in those industries. We're going to spend $10 billion in tax credits on worker training to train our people for the jobs of tomorrow. Now then, we've got to get money from institutions, from individuals, from every place there is money, invested in the treasuries of companies. Now hold that thought. Not shooting dice on Wall Street, invested in the treasuries of companies so that those companies have the money to create jobs. We will create more jobs more quickly by putting money into little companies, startup businesses, small businesses than any other way, but that is high-risk money. The investor may lose it. We've got to give the investor an incentive to put it there as opposed to buying government bonds or putting it in the bank, drawing interest in a savings account that's federally guaranteed. Believe me, this comes back again and again and again and again, and if anybody has any hesitation about it, we'll have a 30-minute program on this one because we're going to put it in the Treasury. The money will be used to build the company, to create jobs, and the tiny little money that goes into that treasury and the tiny little bit of taxes that we don't get will be lost compared to the thousands of people that company may eventually employ, the payroll taxes they'll pay, the income taxes that company will pay. It will be a giant financial pump for our company, country. Business tax increases. We're going to improve the tax collection from foreign companies. That'll get us $21 billion. We'll reduce the business entertainment deduction. You know, kind of almost charge off anything against your income tax on entertainment now. We'll save $16 billion now. Have increase in user's fee of $12 billion. That'll bring us in $49 billion. Other tax increases. Here's one you don't like. Raise the gasoline tax. That brings us $158 billion, which we'll use to rebuild our country. Every other industrialized country has a much higher tax than we're proposing. It's 10 cents additional per year for five years. So it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It just adds up over time to a maximum of 50 cents after five years. The other two candidates like to tell you it's a 50 cent tax. No, it goes on 10 cents a year. And I'll tell you more in a minute about why we have to do it. We'll have a tax increase on tobacco. We'll have an increase uh, on income tax rates for the top 4% of the population. And we'll reduce tax exemptions for the rich. For example, we'll put a ceiling of $250,000 on mortgages that you can deduct. It will be no deduction on uh, mortgages on second homes. Let's go back to gasoline for a minute. Here's what our industrial competitors are doing. Italy collects $3.57 in taxes for every gallon of gasoline. France, $3.12. Japan, $2.25. United Kingdom, $2.09. Germany, $1.99. And the United States collects $0.35. Cents. We have got to collect more taxes in this country and this is one fair place to get it if we spend all of that money on building for the future and don't squander it on some new pork barrel program in Congress. This money will be dedicated for specific purposes. This is going to require sacrifice by all of us. It will pay huge dividends for us, our children, and our grandchildren. Now, I will be delighted if someone can come up with a better idea. If you don't like this, we've got to have a better idea, but this one right here this gasoline tax, let's look at what it raises, $158 billion. Come up with something else that's more painless. It'll give us that. We'll drop it in a minute. Go to that. Entitlement reform. Okay, we're going to have to repeal the salary cap of $130,000 on Medicare. You stop paying after $130,000 of income, you'll have to keep it up under this new program. Medicare premiums were initially designed to pay half the cost of Medicare Part B. Now it's down to 25%. We're going to raise it up to 35%. That'll give us $38 billion. Still a bargain for the people who use it. Healthcare cost containment, we can save $141 billion. You say, how sure am I? Dead sure, and I'll show you in a minute. Here, we, we will reduce COLAs for federal employees. And here, we will tax the top 18% only of Social Security recipients on 85% of their income instead of 50% of their benefits. Now this gets translated by the other two candidates as we're going to tax Social Security. Or last night, the president said we're going to cut it. No. All we're going to do, instead of taxing it at 50%, we're going to tax up to 85% and of the wealthiest. That's just the top 18%. Now, again, if you don't like that one, give me a better idea that will raise $30 billion. Now, why am I so confident that we can reduce health care spending by a dramatic amount? We're going to cut it $141 billion. All right, here's why I think so. 
Look at what the rest of the world spends on health care. 6% of gross national product here. Germany, 8%. Japan, 6.5%. We spend 12% and have an ineffective system. We're spending more than enough to have the world's finest health care. We rank behind 15 other nations in life expectancy and behind 22 other nations in infant mortality. We bought a front row box seat air conditioned and we didn't get to see the show. Just by cleaning this up, there's no question we can do it. We can save money, have world-class health care. All else fails, just copy the country in a, the other part of the world that have better health care than we do at a lower cost. Spending increases. We're going to spend $46 billion extra on research and development to build for the future. We're going to spend $40 billion on infrastructure. We're going to spend $12 billion extra on education and $11 billion extra on aid to cities. That's $109 billion. All of that will stimulate jobs. It's work that has to be done. Now, I have two charts here. They're very detailed. But it takes everything I've said on these charts that are easy to read and shows you in detail how we come down to the fact that we save $750 billion by the end of this uh, cycle. So if anybody wants the detail, it's right here. It will take an hour to go through every number here, but it all adds up. Now, you remember the Wall Street Journal asked the President and Governor Clinton, after they looked at their economic plan, and said, can't either one of you folks add? This one does add up. It is real. Could it be improved? Possibly so. Are we flexible to change it and improve it? Absolutely. A better idea is all it takes. What is the litmus test that it must go through? Is it fair? Is this the best plan for the American people, right? Let's assume you put this in and six months later somebody has a better idea. We can change it. But the thing we can't do is just sit here playing Lawrence Welk music, wonderful, 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 doing nothing. We've got to start moving. Well, here's the result. Over a six-year period, we'll be down to here. We'll have a surplus in our budget. Why didn't we move more aggressively? We didn't want to disrupt the economy. Where will Governor Clinton be? Right up here. Where will President Bush be? Right up here. Just drifting along, if you will. That assumes everything goes well. Everything that I've been able to learn from studying this problem indicates to me that we need to move to do this. Then, of course, the critics during the campaign are saying, gee, if you go too hard and too fast, you might cause a more severe recession. Well, as I have pledged to use the terms of Vietnam, we will not destroy the village in an effort to save it. If common sense and the interest of the American people dictate slowing down, we'll slow down. Just use your head. But the thing you can't do is do nothing. This would be comparable to knowing you had gangrene in your toe and doing nothing and then wondering why you had to lose your whole leg. Now, we have a $4 trillion debt. Let's look at this map here. Look at the purple, and let me tell you what, if we had the $4 trillion still in the bank, we could do with it. Right now it's gone. We don't have much to show for it. Worst public school systems in the industrialized world, most violent crime-ridden society, uh, and uh, mo most drug-laden society, etc., etc., etc. Cities in decay, but that, we know that. Let's clean it up. But if we had $4 trillion, here's what you could do with it. And everything that's purple here. We could buy a $100,000 home for every family in every one of those states. We could put a $10,000 car in the garages of each of these houses. Then we could build $1,000 $10 million libraries for 1,000 cities in these states. We could build 2,000 schools in these states costing $10 million each and have enough left over to put into a savings account, and from the interest alone in that savings account, pay 40,000 nurses and 40,000 teachers an annual salary of $32,760. And finally, we'd still have enough from the interest income alone to give a $5,000 a year bonus to every family in those states. That's what $4 trillion would buy. We just can't keep throwing money out the window. And this is the year when you have a voice because you have organized to have a voice this year and your votes determine who gets into office. Make sure that whoever you vote for in the House, the Senate, and for president is absolutely committed and will handle this problem for you.
We've got to reorganize our government to win the d economic war. We've got to get ourselves organized for the 21st century. Step one, we've got to slash the White House cabinet and congressional staffs. Staffs don't get much done. All the action is in the field. But for example, in 1960, Congress had 6,700 staff members. Today they have 30,000. The White House had 375 in 1960 and today has 1,850. All they do is clutter up communications between the people and the leaders. We've got to change the whole organization in Washington so that people come to Washington to serve us and not to cash in. We absolutely must stop deficit spending. We've got to replace Graham Rudman with a bill that will really eliminate the tricks, the loopholes, and the improper accounting procedures. We've got to give the president line item veto to eliminate pork barrel and waste. We must eliminate PACs, political action committees. We've got to make our elected officials responsive to the people and not to the special interests. That's job one. We've got to eliminate all possibilities of special interests giving large sums of money to candidates, and we must leave no loopholes. We must limit political contributions to $1,000 and no other way. Today, we hold elections on Tuesday. It's hard for working people to vote. They have to go early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Let's change it and hold elections on both Saturday and Sunday. Make it easier for working people to vote. We've got to require all members of Congress and the President to turn in excess political funds from prior campaigns to the U.S. Treasury immediately after a campaign. No grandfather exemptions, no exceptions. We must make adequate television time available in equal amounts to competing candidates. We must eliminate the need to raise millions for campaigns. This corrupts our process. As a matter of principle, we must get rid of all the freebies in Congress and the White House, such as free haircuts, free gymnasiums, free prescription drugs, free ambulance service, and the list goes on forever. These people are our servants. We don't have those things. Why should they? We've got to give the voters the exclusive right to grant Congress, federal employees, and the president a pay raise. That'll keep their heads clear on who they work for. Congress has given itself a retirement plan that's worth two to three times what you and I get. We need to bring it back in line with ours. Makes no sense for the people who work for you to have a better retirement plan than you have. You wouldn't let that happen in your business. 93 members of Congress under the existing pension plan have retirements greater than $2 million. Let's just make it competitive with our pension plans. Congress absolutely must stop exempting itself from laws it imposes on us, such as the Disability Act, the Equal Opportunity Act, the Occupational Safety Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, and believe it or not, sexual harassment. Only in America would they pass laws impacting us and exclude themselves. It's hard to believe, but we've got 1,200 federal airplanes worth $2 billion that are used to fly our servants around like royalty. Get rid of them. Let them get on a commercial airline, have the same experience we have. They work for us. We must restructure our system so that the citizens who come to Washington to serve us cannot cash in as foreign lobbyists. They must stop cashing in on public service. Former federal officials elected, appointed, or career civil service should never be able to serve for lobbyists for domestic interests for five years after they leave office. Never should they be allowed to lobby for foreign countries, companies, or individuals. We should impose criminal penalties for violators. We must pass a law stating that former presidents, vice presidents, cabinet officers, CIA directors, the Federal Reserve chairman, Senate majority leaders and speakers of the House can never lobby for foreign countries, domestic interests, accept gratuities or fees of any kind, or cash in on their service. Our current tax system is like an old inner tube that is covered with patches. We must replace it with a new, fair, simple tax system. Above all, the new system must be fair. It must also raise the necessary revenues. It should be paperless for most Americans. You can't put another patch on the old system and make it work. First, remember Cicero's words. The budget should be balanced. The treasury should be refilled. Public debt should be reduced. The arrogance of public officials should be controlled. That was true 2,000 years ago. History did repeat itself. 
now that we have taken a look at some solutions, where do we go from here? If we will all make the sacrifices that I have suggested, if we will all do our fair share, what can we expect? What can our great country be? Let's look past the moment and take a quick snapshot of the future. If we take the steps I've outlined here today, we can again be a country with its spirit restored, its people back to work, and its government back in order. We can be a country where exporting cars is the rule and importing cars is the exception. I want to be around here when that happens. We can be a purposeful and thriving country, building bridges instead of building debt. We can be a country whose people are working hard at their jobs instead of working hard just to find jobs. We can be a country whose children proudly wear their school colors instead of wearing gang colors. We can be a country whose families save some of what they earn rather than spend more than they can afford. We can be a country with health care that is cost efficient and effective rather than expensive and mismanaged. We can be a country leading the way instead of a country falling behind. We can be a country where once again the diversity of our people is our greatest strength instead of division being our greatest weakness. We can be all of these things tomorrow if we will make the tough choices today. Passing the American dream to our children is vitally important to every single one of us. When I was a young man, it took less than two generations to double the standard of living in our country. Today, because of the way our country has been mismanaged, it will take 12 generations to double the standard of living of our children. Can this be fixed? Of course it can. Will it be easy? No. The sooner we start, the sooner we'll finish. But believe me, it will be a whole lot easier than a lot of the things that people did for this great country who came before us. I'll take this challenge anytime to going west in a covered wagon. I'll take this challenge anytime over the challenge the people had who fought the revolution and gave us our freedom. They had their lives on the line. This is just hard work. If we will do it, if we will team up, if we will make our diversity a strength instead of a weakness, if we will focus on a goal and if we won't quit until the battle is won, we can pass on the American dream to our children because we can do anything in this great country. That is the American dream. We can be anything we want to be. Now, it's going to be tough, but in the thick of it, think of all the difficult things you've done in the past in your life that you totally committed yourself to. I'll bet, in retrospect, these are some of your happiest memories. These are the things you sit around at night and talk about. Think how good we will all feel when we have these problems solved. Together, we can do it. Together, we can do anything. Thank you very much. If you would like to learn more about Ross Perot's plan to fix the economy, please read United We Stand, How We Can Take Back Our Country.